We're using biological models to come up with ways to improve our underwater vehicles, and that's useful because the ones we have now aren't actually very good at the kind of jobs we need them to do for science and research. Most of the underwater vehicles we have are either torpedoes that go straight in a line and they're not very good at doing any kind of sensitive work, or they're big, clunky, remotely operated vehicles that are really expensive. Whereas the stuff that we're doing uh, is inexpensive and maneuverable and can easily do the jobs that we need to get done. And it looks like a dinosaur. I wanted to call it Nessie because the dinosaur we're looking at is the plesiosaur, which has got to be what the Loch Ness Monster was kind of based on. It's the one with the four flippers and the long neck. Um, but yeah, so we're taking some previous research that was done uh, by a PhD student, newly minted Dr. Luke Muscat. Um, and he worked on showing that flapping foils, if you time them right, and you put them one in front of the other in tandem, that you get really high efficiencies and thrusts out of that back foil um, because it's operating in the jet of the front foil. So Luke did measurements and you can get 60% more thrust out of the back foils and 40% higher efficiency. So in games where we're trying to tweak the efficiency of a propeller up from 72 to 74%, uh, going from 70% to 80% is just huge. Uh, I've been doing fluid mechanics for you know longer than I care to <laughs> to tell you, uh, and I'm really interested in understanding the behavior of interfaces, and in particular in situations where you've got a high speed flow um, going past uh, an interface, and we want to understand what happens if that uh, uh, flow is turbulent and it interacts with the interface. What happens next? How do you model that? How do you put that on the computer in a way where you can actually capture what happens in, in real life? So, for example, like mixing in uh, stirred tanks, like we know we need power to actually mix these fluids and the amount of work you need to do or the power or the torque actually is a function of the shear stress or the, it's again the boundaries that are playing the crucial role. You have an impeller, you have water with the air on the top, you rotate the impeller. You have the interface that deforms, and then when you increase the frequency of the impeller, it deforms more until you reach the blade, and then you have a multiple of bubbles. So it's a process of mixing, and that's what I'm doing at this moment. These simulations are useful in, in many different areas, um, in, say, um, pharmaceuticals and mineral processing, um, because a lot of in industrial applications uh, depend on um, the size and the interactions of droplets. Basically, multiphase flows, this area that we're uh, working in, where, which involves this, this issue of uh, a turbulent phase flowing past uh, an interface, is central to just about every processing equipment in manufacturing. So if you, if you get that bit of physics wrong, then you're making all kinds of wrong predictions in designing lots of things which are important from an industrial perspective. And we think that that's one of the main reasons why there is a lot of inefficiency in design. When we have a body, an object that isn't streamlined, so generally we get a weight off the back of the object, which is unstable, and we want to see how we can change the characteristics of that wake. If you were sat downstream of the object, if there was a normal wake, you'd see some oscillation in the flow that it would be unsteady. But if you could reduce that, if you were downstream, you wouldn't necessarily, in the extreme case, know that the object was there, or you might assume that the object was smaller because the oscillations were less. Uh, so there's applications towards like cloaking objects. But equally, if we can enhance the uh, unsteadiness in the wake, we can create energy harvesting devices. Uh, in our work, we attach a flexible tail to the rear side of the object. There's materials that you can um, make that, when they oscillate, generate an electric current. So then you can extract that, so you're going from a steady flow into an oscillating field and you can start to generate electricity. And if you could put an array of these at the bottom of the ocean where you've got relatively steady flow, you could extract energy out there, which is obviously good for renewable energy sources.